Welcome to Thoughts and Teens TV show. I am Patricia Tripp. It is no other than Anne Tripp from the WBLS, the news director. And she's also Thoughts and Teens 2010 Humanitarian Awardee. And you know why we award her as a humanitarian? Because she has done so much for the community. She has so done much for the ra radio personality. And she still continues doing a lot more for youth. So, Anne. We welcome you. Thank you very Thoughts much. Teens. Thanks and very much. And we must say we appreciate you accepting our award Thank as you. Thoughts and Teens 2010 Humanitarian. And you're now officially our Humanitarian for 2010. Well, thank you because you're my favorite humanitarian <laughs> because <laughs> of the things that you do for the youngest people in the community. And I greatly admire you. And thank you very, very much. Thank you, Anne. You know, this month is um, Women's Month. Women's and History Month, And there are a lot yes. of great women that you known the history and you're well aware of we're going to ask you to share some of your views of women of that you are familiar with and of great values for the community for the development of america for making women today who they are share some of your views there are there are so many and the reason i say that is that every Women's History Month and every Black History Month, because we're just coming out of that, you hear about many uh, African American leaders and people who have done so many things, but very often you hear about the same people you, over and over again. Over and over again. Okay. Uh, for instance, last month for Black History Month, one of the uh, th specials that I featured was on the, uh, the Patterson family of Greenfield, Ohio. Now, people don't know about the Patterson family of Greenfield, Ohio, but they made their own cars. Oh. So people don't know that black Americans made cars, that any black Americans or blacks anywhere on the planet had their own car company. And you can find it on the internet. You can look them up, the Patterson family of Greenfield, Ohio, and you'll see the, the little Model T cars that they made. Um, the, the patriarch of the family uh, was uh, an enslaved person who gained his freedom, and he was a blacksmith, so he was making uh, carts and buggies and stuff like that. His son began to make trucks and cars. So after a while, the big, the big, big car companies kind of like squeeze them out. You know how that's done in business, but it mm -hmm. doesn't take anything away from that family. So that's what I kind of like to do. I like to dig around and I like mm -hmm. to find out about people that you're not going to hear about, so that young people and other people won't say, "Oh yeah, well I know all about that person," because you don't know about these people, nope. <laughs> and there are so many of them. Like we were talking about queens off the air, you yeah. and I. And I always like to bring up Queen Nzinga. And Queen Nzinga, she was from Africa. She was in Africa. She was born in 1582. So that kind of puts us where we're at, 1582, a long time ago. And she was the first Amazon queen, which is to say she got the females in her, in her tribe together and taught them to fight. And they defended their children, and they defended the tribe. So when you see Amazons on television portrayed, you see these big, tall, you know, blonde women and all that, and that's fine. But the first Amazons are really black females. Mm -hmm. And she successfully fought the Portuguese and kept them off the backs of her people for a very, very long time. Uh, she died, I think, in her 80s or 90s or something like that. And mm -hmm. she was a queen, but she was a warrior. And you don't hear about her very no, often. No, it's the first time I right? hear about her. Yeah, and I, I brought this uh, statement from Oprah Winfrey that I thought you might like. Um, Oprah Winfrey says, quote, I am where I am because of the bridges that I crossed. Sojourner Truth was a bridge, Harriet Tubman was a bridge, Ida B. Wells was a bridge, Madam C.J. Walker was a bridge, Fannie Lou Hamer was a bridge. Now, two of these women I really particularly like. Um, I like uh, Fannie Lou Hamer because she was a civil rights activist. And Fannie Lou Hamer coined the phrase, I'm sick and tired of being I'm sick, sick and, tired. and tired. Now, other people will borrow that phrase and mm -hmm. they act like they came up with it was Fannie Lou Hamer who said, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. And that is a very empowering way to look at things because that means you, you've assessed your situation and you're sick of it and you intend to do something about it. And, and Fannie Lou Hamer, in fighting for the right to vote in the South, was beaten up like a, as though she were a man by the police. She was beaten within an inch of her life several times. She was shot at. You know, it, 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 takes, it takes so much intestinal fortitude, so much guts to do what these people have done because at the times that they were living, this was truly taking your life in your own hand. 
And 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 Fannie Lou Hamer was a, a woman who didn't have much education, but she did have a beauty of thought and the intelligence to know what circumstances were and to adapt and to change those circumstances. So that's a woman we need to mention, I think, much yeah. more. Mm -hmm. And of course, Madam C.J. Walker, who mm -hmm. people have heard of, I'm sure, and she was the, now the people get it kind of messed up. She wasn't the first millionaires. She was the first self-made millionaires, black or white or pink or purple in this country. First black self-made. Now there, there are women who, had, who were millionaires, because they inherited their money from either their dead fathers or their dead husbands. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm still working, so I haven't inherited anything yet. <laughs> so you know, but she made her money, and that's what's so very, very important. And again, she she was from Louisiana. She was married at a very young age, uh, widowed at a very young age, but yet she de she devised ways for for black women to, to do their hair, and you know, because the things that they had didn't have much, mm -hmm. but they were pulling black women's hair out, and you know, it, it, she said, no, no, we can be beautiful too, and she got into cosmetics, and and even uh, and she did stuff door to door, which uh, used to be done like a company like the Philip Fuller Brush Company used to go door to door and sell things. Mm -hmm. She did things door to door, and she had uh, she empowered other women in other cities because women. Uh, needed monies and she gave these kits out they were like franchises mm -hmm. you know only you did really work directly under her and these women in all these other cities around the country were able to make a living for their families by going door to door selling Madam C.J. Walker's beauty products mm -hmm. so it was like the Avon before the Avon lady Game was you know and that was Madam C.J. Walker she was also an example uh, and people don't talk about her in the right way but they need to, to see that she was an incredible entrepreneur and that people followed her example. She didn't follow anyone's uh, anyone's example. She she made it. You know, she was the original. So we, I really like to talk about her. But I'm sure there are other people that you you might want to know about in any other field. Just fire away. You know, because this this thought just came into me, and I am thinking that these women who have done so much, especially black women, and they are not being heard of on mm -hmm. unheard. And this is something that needs to be established more, not only to teaching them in school, but to actually to create the empire for women um, from these bridges, according to um, Opro, from these bridges that these, these women, history should be enforced into our young women so they can see a pattern because of the the life that is going today is not the pattern of the women who struggle to make us better. Mm -hmm. We are just being um, used and abused, and what am I say, cosmetic for other for other people to become millionaires. So these are the things that need to be taught, not to just write and go, oh, she's a forest woman. It should be the history should be pertained, and young women should understand where it came from. Yes, and when anybody says, oh, you know what I think we need to do, I think we need to be entrepreneurs, I like what they say, but that's wrong, and I'll tell them. I said, first of all, we've always been entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Now, what you need to do is go to a library and open a book, mm -hmm. because it's not something new that you've done. I was just reading about uh, Leah Chase. Now, Louisiana has a special uh, a fondness. I have a fondness for Louisiana, because some of my people are from Louisiana. And although um, America uh, are states generally that are tied together with the exception of Alaska and Hawaii. And so, um, we still have different cultures depending upon what part of the country that we're from. We eat different food. Uh, we celebrate different holidays. So it's, it's like the Caribbean. Although the Caribbean, the islands and the, and, and, and the countries are separate. So you say, well, they must have a separate history and they must have mm -hmm. a separate uh, lineage of things and, and things that they do and food. Well, we do also, but we're just connected. So, so I try to explain that to people also that we, for instance, Louisiana, of course, was, is a French. Louisiana is the only state in the, in the U.S. Uh, whose law is based on French law, not on, not on British law. And so Louisiana has a different, a different kind of history, a different racial history as well. Mm -hmm. But it was a very racist place, very racist mm -hmm. place. And there was, they had at one point uh, restaurants where black people could not sit in a, in a restaurant and eat. If they took, went to a restaurant, they had to take it out and you know eat out in the gutter, and they had to go out. You know, they could not have their own restaurant where they could actually sit down and get service. And uh, a guy named Dookie Chase and his wife Leah, they had a restaurant in the blacker area, 
and they decided to have to teach the waiters how to serve and have give white glove service and all that kind of stuff and the restaurant became called Dookie Chase. Mm -hmm. Dookie Chase is still there today and President Obama has eaten there, President Bush has eaten there, President Clinton has eaten in Dookie Chase. It's a famous Creole restaurant in Louisiana. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was and it was started because they wanted a place where where black people could also sit down and 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 have a meal at one point the local police the white police surrounded the 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 door and said demanded know what's going on in here because they would see so many blacks go in there dress well stay there for a long time and come out they thought i guess they were having some kind of meeting now there were meetings civil rights meetings that they allowed their upper floors to house they if they wanted to have a meeting they said you can go upstairs we have a nice little place for you to meet so that was going on but it was a restaurant and and to to think that that white police officers would think that there's something wrong and need to be checked out because you're going into an establishment to eat mm -hmm. dinner is bizarre if you think about today mm -hmm. but if you think about then it was very very important and for them to stand up and say no this is what we want um, was very very uh, revolutionary because a lot of blacks who had businesses had those businesses burned down mm -hmm. with them in it sometimes mm -hmm. you know so so there was always this um, move to stifle any kind of black exactly. professional business progress you know so so a lot of different fronts uh, we, we we kept we kept pushing and we kept, and we have a lot of st uh, stick to itiveness because of that and I think that's passed down uh, to all of us but I think for young people who don't know about it they need to hear about it they need to know that being strong standing up and coming up with your own idea is not something strange mm -hmm. that has been done before one of the first black ma male millionaires in Atlanta was a guy named Alonzo Herndon and what he did he cut hair he cut hair but he decided to take enough but he was very good he cut white men's hair and they, he was very popular so he made a lot of money he took the money, saved the money, and he bought a building in an area of Atlanta, and he fixed the building up, it had several floors, and he brought other black men into the building on each floor, and they had to wear like uh, black tux and white gloves and everything, and they provided the best service and the hot towel and the everything, the beep, the bop, mm -hmm. the boop, on each floor. All the rich white men wanted to go to his establishment and get their face yes. and hair done and everything. He was making so much money that the other local barbers, the white barbers, complained to the officials about this black man making all this money. And they said they passed a law, they actually passed a law that no black man can cut a white man's hair, that no black man can service a white person. Well, the white people that he serviced were so rich and had so much power, they kept going to him, mm -hmm. daring the authorities to arrest them. So eventually they forgot about it, and, and Alonzo Herndon became one of the uh, earlier black millionaires of Atlanta. Mm -hmm. So again, our stories, male and female, are stories of staying in there and doing what you need to do and, and not forgetting your dream and pushing and pushing and pushing until you're able to do it. And ingenuity and entrepreneurship is nothing new to us. It's nothing new to our, our women. It's nothing new to our men. Our women are, very, are, very, are inventors, uh, just like our men were. And for the same reason, pretty much, because we were doing the work. Mm -hmm. And the people whom we were working for as enslaved people mm -hmm. were not going to make our jobs easier. What did they care? They weren't doing it. Mm -hmm. So we had to do what we had to do. That's why a black woman has the patent for the, for, for, for the uh, first ironing board. Do you think that the person that she worked for was going to say, you know what? I think I'll help you, Sadie. I'll help you do it better. I'm going to come up with something to make your work easier. No. Mm -hmm. Her boss didn't, didn't do ironing. Sadie did it, so she had to come up. Actually, her name is Sarah. Um, Sarah did it, so she got a patent for the first ironing board. Um, the first cabinet bed, which it's still sold, a, a version of it, a not very much different version, is sold in upscale, uh, upscale catalogs today, and it's like a cabinet, a very pretty cabinet. When you open the cabinet, you can pull out a single bed. Mm -hmm. That's sold in catalogs today, the same thing. Well, that was patented, the very first one was patented by a black female because she didn't have room, was her black people, they didn't have a lot of room, they didn't have several uh, uh, bedrooms, but they had children. They might have people come over, you know, that had to stay, were traveling through town or something like that, so you needed some place to put an extra bed, you know. So again, we invented stuff because
doing the work. Um, a, um, a housewife, a black housewife, not even an engineer, um, Henrietta Bradbury, um, she invented a, a torpedo, a way to, to, to actually torpedo that the Army and the Navy can use. Mm -hmm. And she's not even an engineer. Mm -hmm. you know, so, and she's alive today, by the way. She's okay. alive today. So there are a lot, of, uh, a lot of things that, as black women, we have brought to the table besides just bearing our wonderful black men and, and telling them what they've done. We've done a lot ourselves. Kathy Hughes right now, I was uh, telling you, Kathy Hughes is from Omaha, Nebraska, and she owns a television network called TV One which is on all the cable stations, and it's for adult black people. It's geared toward adult blacks. The programming, the movies, all that, geared toward adult blacks. And she owns Radio One, which I think she owns about 68 different radio stations wow. all over <laughs> the country. And she's out of Omaha, Nebraska. And so there are, there are many black women doing so many, so many different things. And I love to tell stories because a, a story gives you the, the, you know, the background, the fullness. It gives you the trees and the birds and the grass to the story so you really can, can see. I always talk about Mildred Loving. Mildred Loving had a husband. Well, she grew up with a guy named Perry, Perry Loving. And she was a, a black person from the South, black Native American mix like so many blacks are from the South. And he was white. And they grew up together. They loved each other. They got married. Well, that was against the law. So they tried to put them in jail. And then they got out of jail. They said, okay, we'll get you out of jail, but you have to leave this county. We don't want you in here. They were from Virginia. We don't want you in Virginia. So they had to go. They ended up in Washington, D.C. And they were refused housing. As soon as the people they were renting from found out that that was his wife, they would refuse housing and other things. They had a lot of problems. Well, anyway, uh, Perry Loving decided to take the whole matter to the Supreme Court and to say, I should be able to marry whomever I wish to marry. Mm -hmm. And their case um, is the reason that people in this country can marry whomever they want of whatever race. It's the Loving versus Loving case. Uh, a movie was made out of it starring mm -hmm. Leela Rashawn as Mrs. Loving mm -hmm. and I think Timothy Hutton played Perry Loving. Now, Perry Loving only died about maybe 15 years ago. And I think Mrs. Loving died maybe five years ago. Mm -hmm. They had several children. And up till then, in this country, a lot of white men had black wives. But what they did, they would pretend the wife was their servant. And then when they had these little beige children, they'd either send them down south to be raised by family, or they would say, oh, that's the maid's children. What Perry Loving and Mildred Loving decided to do is fight. Fight for visibility. Fight for the right to marry whomever you want and not have to think about going to jail or something like that or sending your children away or lying about your children or saying that this is, this is not my wife, this is my maid, you know, stuff like that. So in her way, Mildred Loving is also a black history maker. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of different oh, things. A lot of different things. Because, you know, and I, I, as you were talking, I'm just thinking, how can this message be sent to women <laughs> throughout the world? Let them know what they can do. Because we always feel that we are women are not to take are to take orders from men or you know we are men we become the, the women um men who abuse women and that pride that confidence in ourselves mm -hmm. we don't have because we obviously we don't have role models and then we look to the right we see a white we look to the left we see and these women who have done so much in the community so much to make a difference they're History is actually being covered down. The most I will hear about the lady, um, oh God, that the one that sit on the bus. Rosa you, Parks. Rosa Parks. But these women are not being mentioned. Yes. I mean, we have Shirley Chisholm right here from New York City, of and course. You, and she's, she's half Guyanese and half Asian. And we don't Beijing. hear nothing much about her. But you, have, you say Shirley. The but very what first black like congresswoman. The history, like the history, be, even in youth groups. These are the history because we are the ones who are in youth groups. The, Black kids are in the youth groups. You won't hardly find the um, the white kids in a youth group, like how the black kids will be in a youth group. And this is what our community leaders should be venturing off, teaching them um, about being young entrepreneurs, of creating mm -hmm. and being, you know, first person to do this or first person to to do something that is great that could bring in turn them into what they want to be, but we all look to football, basketball, so. And even that has changed, Miss um, Trim. When I was younger, there were boys that wanted to, to play basketball. 
they wanted basketball scholarships. But you know why? Because they wanted a free college education. Mm -hmm. So when I was growing up, the boys did play basketball because they wanted a way to pay for college. Mm -hmm. Now the young people who play basketball, they seriously, they want to go to the NBA. Mm -hmm. But only one out of 100 of them will even get to sniff the NBA. So, and then when they don't get those dreams, you know, they kind of mess around in school and they, they might as well be majoring in lunch. They're not paying attention because they feel, well, I'm going to get my shot in the NBA. I'm going to make all this kind of money. Um, but, but when I was younger, the boys did want scholarships. Mm -hmm. They played football to get a scholarship. They were like, oh, I can go to, I can go to Oberlin. I can go to a college if I get a basketball scholarship because that will pay so my parents don't have to put that money, don't have to put the money out. And when I come out, I don't have this enormous bill that I'll be paying for the first 15 to 20 years of my working life. Mm -hmm. you know? But that's why they went in. So I would like to see a return to that. I don't mind athletics. We certainly do need to be. There's so many of us that are really, really heavy at a very young age. I've seen some young people that are 12, 13, 14, oh, okay. and they're some of them almost as big as this table. I mean, you know, put, put a few years on before you get big, you know, like I did. I had to wait a while. Wait a while. You know, and when you're that young, you shouldn't be that heavy. And, and a lot of things were taken out of the schools because of budget cuts. Gradually, gym was taken out of school. That's one of the things. Um, band was taken out. Art history, language, a lot of things were taken out of schools gradually over the years. So we have a young, a group of young people that really don't know a lot about art. A lot of them don't really know how to play instruments, mm -hmm. which is why we have this hip hop thing, which was they were scratching other records because they still had that creativity and they had to get it mm -hmm. out, where before you would learn how to play an instrument mm -hmm. in school. Mm -hmm. And they don't, they're, they're not exercising. So unless they feel that they have uh, some uh, ability on the court, with a basketball or with a football, you don't see them moving around. You don't see them, you know, in the gyms. You don't see them doing that. Mm -hmm. So I don't mind if, if they if they if they get into sports. I would like all young men, all of them, to stay more in, focused in sports and women because they have scholarships for women too. Nothing they have they basketball have scholarships mind. even for women. Yeah. You know, they have golf scholarships for women. They have a lot of scholarships. So if you stay active and you do these things, you can get a free college education, and that's what we that's what we should be focusing on, in my opinion. And, and shows like this one, where you're actually asking and we're discussing things and we're discussing people in our community who have done things and, and some of the people who we need to look back, some of our ancestors. This is what this is for. This is, a very, in my opinion, a very valuable thing because everybody watching, I hope you're watching and I hope you're <laughs> writing things down and also learning. And I want you to go on the Internet and look up the Patterson family of Greenfield, Ohio. Look up these people. Look up Kathy Hughes. Look up The Loving. Look those stories up and find out more about them, more than we can tell in this segment. Okay, and you have talked so much about the Black history. You have, I have learned. You have given me some knowledge that I never had. And, you know, I'm sure there are a lot of young people out there who never hear of these things before or never know them, even their parents. They never know about it. But how could you get this knowledge? And first, I think we have to educate the parents, to work yes. with the parents so that the children can, because you're educating the children and if the parents are not there for them, there's just like, the parents don't know what, what they're being taught or what. So the parents need to be educated. But Anne, you have talked so much. Let me ask, who is Anne Tripp? Having so much knowledge and so much inspiration that can teach the whole wide world with her experience. Okay, this is who I am. I'm born and raised in Brooklyn and extremely proud of it. Because in Brooklyn, I think they speak like 92 different languages in Brooklyn, okay? I've met people from other places. I lived in Europe off and on for five years when I was a singer because I started with opera first. And people would say, oh, they speak two languages where I come from. Like, ooh, big deal. In my place in Brooklyn, they speak 92. Thank you very much. Next. What you can get in New York, just being in New York and just inhaling what's around is such an education about people. A different person from a different country is your cab driver. Someone else from another country sells you your newspaper. Another person from another country is the conductor. You know, they're, they're, there's someone else is serving you your food. Someone mm -hmm. else is making that hamburger for you. If you just ask people about their lives and who they are, there's a wealth of information that's just out here in the street for people who are from New York. And my parents had friends of all different kinds and stripes. My mother learned how to make couscous from uh, her friend, Miss Janine, who was Algerian. You know, we had a lot of different kinds of people in our home. And my parents always said, never turn your nose up at anything unless you've tried it. 
They wouldn't allow us to look at food and go, eh, that was like considered very ignorant. Um, and we also felt that way about culture. My, my parents said, we are very proud of who we are, but we don't think we're better than anyone else. Mm -hmm. Everybody's culture has value. Everybody's culture has heroes. And try to learn about everybody's culture and never put your own culture above anyone else's. Mm -hmm. But always be proud of who you are. So my mom especially was a big reader and she, both my parents were, had their early education in the South. So they had black teachers and in the South, black teachers taught black history to the kids. I remember that we couldn't use toothpaste, my brother and I. I didn't see toothpaste until I was almost in high school because we had to use tooth powder, which was so disgusting. Mm -hmm. But we used it because a black man invented tooth powder and a white man only made it into paste. So my mother made sure that we knew a black man made that, a pound, the, the dentifrice, the clean. So there are ways that she taught us lessons. And also, of course, you know, there is the Schomburg Library. And I should mention that because you talked about where, kid, where parents can go. And they have wonderful programs at the Schomburg. And the Schomburg was founded by, uh, well, it's named after uh, a chronicler of, of black history, one of the many, but a very good one. His name was Arturo Schomburg. Mm -hmm. He was originally from, I think, St. Thomas, and but he was raised in Puerto Rico. And he got interested in black history because when he said he, when he went to Puerto Rico and he was in school, they were talking about Spanish history, the Spaniards and blah, blah, blah. And he said, what about blacks? And, and the teacher said to him, blacks don't have any history. They've never done anything. Mm. So because they said that to him, yeah, he, he was, had, yeah, he knew he had to find, he didn't believe it. He wouldn't believe it. And he searched and he searched and he searched and he started cataloging and grabbing things together and putting different and finding about black people who had done things everywhere in the world. And you can find a lot of that stuff in the Schomburg. There are other historians, of course, Carter G. Woodson, so many other. But, but, but it's interesting that the Schomburg Center is named after Arturo Schomburg because of his unique way and his unique journey to finding about, about himself as a black man because he was told that black people had no history and that black people had never done anything. Okay, Anne, I know your talk is so interesting and so educational and inspirational to our viewers and to me. I would like to have you back to do some more talking on these, these topics that is very interesting to know who we are and where we came from and who, who brought us into this, to America, who bring us to the America life. Mm -hmm. We need to know of our black his, historians. Um, we will, I will have you back and able to have more talk with you because this is a lesson of life, learning, and, and educating our people, our viewers, our young people about their ancestors, about their history, and the real history because we only know about white history. It's time we know more about our black history. True. So, Antrop, it was nice having you on this show, our guest, as we know our guest, and, and our, as our 2010 humanitarian. Thank you. Thanks very much. I, Hope that you'll be able to come back and give us some more advice on and talk more about black history because I think black history should not only be February month, it should be every day, 365 days a year. Because I, black history because is American history. Is American history. Yes. And we all have, no matter how you may be white, you still have a little bit of black blood in you. Mm -hmm. And if you have a cell phone, you have a black invention. You have because the gamma electric cell was invented by a black man, he's from Alabama, and that is why we don't have to have, we can carry a phone around and we don't need to plug it in, because of yeah. a black man, black that's man. his genius. Okay, so thank you Anne again, so that was Thoughts and Teasons Focus with our 2010 humanitarian honorary and trip, giving us her, giving us the live and direct information of black historian, which we never knew, and, and she will be back again to give us some more inspiration, more ideas about our black historian. So from Thoughts and Teens in Focus, I say goodbye until next time. Cut. We doing another 25 minutes with her. What? Another 25 minutes with her. I have to go. Okay. You have to, okay.